we're really excited to have a, an awesome week this week, but it starts off with um, two awesome guests, uh, Dr. Amanda Visick and um, Heather Mannix, and the show is all yours. Just remember, people who are on Zoom, make sure you're doing the question and answer box. And if you're on Facebook Live, we see you, ask questions on comments, I will be passing them, passing them on to uh, Dr. Visick and Heather. So the show is yours, thanks. All right, so I'm very excited today to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Amanda Visick. Um, Amanda is a sports scientist, a researcher and professor at the George Washington University. Her background is in sports psychology. Um, she's also a certified mental performance coach as well. Um, her applied community-based research focuses on how to create the optimal environment for development through fun, positive sport experiences. So she's worked with local, regional, national, and international organizations to help them um, adopt and integrate this research into their coaching education programs. Um, I've had personally the pleasure of working with her on the research um, for the past seven years. And right now she's currently working with the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation to develop a Swedish version of the fun maps that's then going to be integrated into their um, coaching education program. As somebody who spent most of her childhood and adolescence in an ice hockey rink, um, I think she'll feel right at home with this group. <laughs> so, Amanda, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Heather. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, thanks everyone for, for joining us this afternoon. We're gonna spend the next hour or so really talking about fun and breaking down what it is. And so I have really just three main objectives for us today, and that's to have a better understanding of what fun is and exactly what it is not, to provide you with the navigational tools to really understand fun, and then to start to plant the seed in terms of helping you understand how to actually take the science and apply it into your coaching sessions. So when we talk about fun, right, it's this three letter word and it can kind of have really two sides to this, this type of coin if you want to metaphorically think about it that way. So very often we use fun to talk about you know, it's this kind of like throwaway word when people talk about, oh, just, you know, if the kids want to play for fun, then they're going to play on the house league or the rec league, right? It's not synonymous with playing high level competitive hockey. And then the other flip side is this true appreciation for what fun really, really truly is and, that, and, and understanding that it's an integral part of the sport experience. So in trying to break this down, a lot of this science that, that I've been doing over the years really came out in, I think, early 2015. And I can't advance my slides. Oh, All right, click it. You got yeah. it. We good? Yeah. You're good. You're all good. Power yep. back. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about fun in terms of these, these two different ways that we tend to think about it, right? Emily West, a few years after this research came out, I think did a really phenomenal job um, within USA Hockey and talking about in this blog post and really breaking down fun in a very simple, meaningful way that I think is quite consumable. And so what she talked about here, and you can see, you know, what is this three letter word that makes people so incredibly uncomfortable sometimes, right? So a lot of times people think about fun as something to be feared or that if you're playing high level hockey, that it is not synonymous with having fun. On the flip side, people also think about it in terms of something that is welcomed, it's celebrated, it's an integral part of the sport experience. And so what she really talks about here is trying to find an alternative word to using fun because it has these negative connotations. But yet when we look at the science, we know that fun is the number one determinant of why kids play. Lack or absence of fun is the number one reason why we lose kids from sport. 
And if we look at, at athletes that are performing at the highest levels and the science that's been done behind the USOPC, what we find as well is that we, when we ask these athletes, you know, what, what got you involved? What motivated you to play your sport? And they always talk about fun as this big factor that played a role in their youth experiences. And then when you ask them, well, what really propelled you to pursue your sport at the highest level possible? Again, fun is the central theme that comes out. So I know last week when, when Dean Crailers was on and he talked about this concept of physical literacy, right? And <clears throat> which I find incredibly interesting, both as a former athlete and as a sports psychologist, right? This idea of movement competence, confidence and motivation, right? These are all of these psychological and emotional constructs that we talk about in the context of these sport experiences. And physical literacy is talked about largely in terms of movement, competence, confidence and motivation and how that fuels active participation. There's lots of other sport models that are out there. Some of them include connection or the sense of belonging and character. And I think Dean alluded to a lot of that before as well. So when you think about this kind of cyclical, interrelational association between these different factors, when we're talking about physical literacy, you know, I think one of his big messages is that we can, we can think very simply that athletic development or that sport is powered by physical literacy, right? But how do you actually construct movement, competence, confidence, motivation, connection, character, all of these things that we know that sport does. And so we could also attest, or I would attest, that physical literacy is actually powered by fun. And that if we have a framework for really understanding what this experience is, because the science, as I'll show you here shortly, connects to movement, competence, confidence, motivation, connection, character, and constant movement and active participation. So there's another way that we can think about this in a very holistic way that gives us a better understanding and appreciation of actually how to enact these things. So within the scope of USA Hockey or any other big sport in GB, right, whether we're talking about movement, competence, confidence, or motivation, or we're talking about the three Ps, right? Continued participation is a goal of a lot of sport organizations. And for more of the community parks and recs organizations, that is like, that is their pivotal thing. They're all about inclusive participation. Other organizations always talk about high performance, right? Or you talk about participation as separate from high performance as, the, as if these are two separate goals. And then always, again, personal development. And so what's interesting though is in North America, we tend to have a very narrow and siloed approach to understanding these concepts instead of really looking at the interplay between them and how they, how they really kind of dance together is another way to metaphorically think about this. So even if we throw a connection and character into there as well, depending upon what different sport models you're using to guide your practice sessions and your coaching philosophy, again, ultimately it comes down to how do we actually do these things? And so from the science that we've conducted so far, I would say that the fun maps are the foundation to building into these things. They give you the actions, the behaviors, the specific things that we can do as coaches to create these more positive, high quality, fun sport experiences for kids. <clears throat> so in doing research, uh, <laughs> I am and have always been a visual learner, right? So even as an athlete, being out on the ice, I always had to have, at each stage of development, I always had to have a coach that could show me exactly what to do. Not just stand on the sidelines or <clears throat> on the borders of the rink and, and talk about like, you know, this is what you need to do. I needed a coach that could actually show me. 
So from a visual representation standpoint, what I wanted to be able to do is to take this concept of fun that we know has so much power, right? Because it is what keeps kids involved in sport. And it has these two different, a negative and a positive connotation to them. And what I wanted to do was as a sport scientist, be able to give coaches in sport organizations a visual framework that they can use to be able to make fun something that is palatable and that they can act on. So in doing that, what I used was a type of action research that's called concept mapping. And so what we did is we went out into the field and we asked kids to brainstorm, sort, and rate. And essentially what we're doing is we're asking them, tell us all the different things that make playing sport fun for you. And when they did that, their answers were phenomenal, right? This gives you a visual representation of all of the different ideas that they generated and said, this is what makes playing sport fun for me. So as a coach, I'm thinking, well, if I look at this, this is great, but it's almost like, woo, <laughs> it's too much, right? So how do I make sense of this three letter word that's really been blown up into lots and lots of different things that actually make sport fun? We call those fun determinants. And so after we had all of this data, what we did is we went back to those same athletes and we asked them, you did an incredible job brainstorming all of these different ideas you came up with more than we could have ever even imagined. And we want you to help make sense of all of this data for us. So what we need you to do next is to sort all of these different fun determinants into piles in a way that makes sense to you. And there's no right or wrong way to sort the piles. And as you're sorting them, we want you to give them a name, right? So if you put these five ideas together, what do you call that? If you put these 10 ideas together, give that a name. And then we also ask them to rate in terms of importance, all of the different fun determinants. And so we said they can't all be equally important. So we need you to help us decipher what is most important and what is least important. So we had them rate on a scale of one to five, one being relatively not important to five being extremely important, how much each of these things contributes to how much fun you have. So when we did that, and we aggregated all of this data back together, we get these series of maps. And so what's in front of you right now is what we call point map. And this is just a very visual, innovative way of taking lots of complex data that these kids generated and putting it in a simple framework that we as coaches can understand. So each of the dots that's here on the slide represents one of the 81 fun determinants that they generated, right? So again, let's just go back to this and let that permeate and sink in, right? That each one of these represents a specific data point. And so through their sorting, what they did is they put these into piles, remember? So each point on the map represents its relationship to all the other points on the map and how they were sorted. So they generated 81 specific ideas of what is fun, and then they sorted them. And so each one of these data points represents one of those 81 ideas. So you can see partner and small group drills down here at the bottom, scrimmaging, and then doing lots of different drills and activities during practice. And you juxtapose that to point, let's say 29, which is keeping a positive attitude, to having people cheer at the game, which is point 47. Right, so this is just a spatial representation of their conceptualization of how these things are similar and different from one another. So when you continue doing more analysis on all of this data, it partitions all of their fun ideas into 11 discrete 
factors or piles, if you will. So this essentially is a visual representation of how kids on average took all of those different 81 determinants and sorted them into those different piles, right? And as they sorted, we asked them to give each pile a name. So we used their words in order to determine <clears throat> what each of the piles is called. So what we found through this data is that there are four primary sources of fun. And kids conceptualize that into games, practices, learning and improving, trying hard, mental bonuses, positive team dynamics, team friendships, team rituals, positive coaching, game time support, and our favorite swag. So this is a visual representation, again, of all of the 81 fun determinants that they generated and how they conceptually understand these things fitting together. So remember too, after we asked them to sort, right? So this is a visual representation of how they sorted all of those ideas. We asked them to also rate. When they rated, we're able to then construct these maps, these fun maps in, in three-dimensional space to represent what is more important and what is less important. So you can see here down in the bottom right-hand corner, <clears throat> the number of layers of each of these factors is congruent with how, in, how high or low it was rated in terms of importance on that one to five scale. So you can take a look at just this one map here and very easily see what the top fun factors are. And that's trying hard positive team dynamics and positive coaching. And then you can also very easily see that swag and team rituals are all the way down at the bottom. And everything else is kind of clustered in between. So what's nice about these maps, right, is that they take this really, really incredibly rich data that these young athletes generated. It gives us a visual representation of what fun is in the mind of a child. And then it provides us these directional beacons in terms of really understanding how do we act upon these things. So as coaches, or as a coach, I would immediately be drawn to, well, what is, what is contained within positive coaching? How do kids define positive coaching as it relates to fun? And so you can zoom out on this, on this fun map here, and then just like we do on Google Maps or Waze or anything else that we're looking at, we can zoom in. And when we do that, we can take positive coaching and we can zoom in in this way, and we can look at each specific data point that the kids sorted into positive coaching. And we can see that it includes all of these 12 fun determinants here. So everything from treating players with respect, being encouraging, positive role model, being able to give very clear, consistent communication and instructions in terms of what to do. A coach that has a lot of knowledge, they allow mistake while, mistakes while staying positive. They're approachable, they're easy to listen to, and that they're an engaging coach, right? Someone that is able to be very interactive with that. So <clears throat> when we do this, we're able to then have some sense of not only what is most important to kids in terms of these 11 fun factors, but we also know within each factor what is most important and what is least important. And so what we've done over the course of the last few years in publishing all of this data is look at it from lots of different ways. And so <clears throat> from these scientific papers, what we've also been able to do is take the findings from all of these and then to distill them down into infographics and things that are much more consumable. So what we have here is a visual representation of two of these scientific studies that we've done on the fun maps that breaks down 
all 11 fun factors in order of most importance to least important. So trying hard being number one, swag being number 11 all the way at the bottom. And then each of these fun determinants, the 81 that they came up with, you can see are ordered within each fun factor in order of most importance to least importance. Right, so this helps gives us some directional indication of what kids are looking for and where they place value when it, when it comes to their fund priorities. So what I'll do after the webinar as well is tweet this out so that you have this as a resource as well, which is really helpful. Um, the scientific paper, so I'll go back here really quickly. All three of these scientific papers, they were, this research was funded by the National Institutes of Health. So they are all publicly available as well. So you can find these quickly through Google. If you can't find them, um, you can tweet me, email me. I'm happy to share it as well. And then our latest paper, which is the one in the top left hand corner here toward understanding youth athletes fund priorities, looking at that data based on sex, age and levels of play was actually just selected, I found out yesterday, um, to be free through the journal. So it, it is, the, it is um, the one that's access free. <laughs> so we hit the lottery in that respect. Um, had we not, you still had, would have eventually had access through it through, uh, through PubMed as well, but it's there for you for sure. So everything's out there, it's consumable and it's easy to get your hands on. So moving away from, from here, the idea is if I'm a coach, right, so I go, I go from here, right, here's the science. So you have people like me that do the hard rigor behind all of these different scientific studies, just, just like Dean Creolars. And we then take this data and we make it as consumable as possible, right, because that's what my goal is as a sports scientist practitioner, is I want to do the, the hard science, the rigor, and then to put it in the hands of coaches so that you are empowered to use it in every way possible. When we take all of this data within the fun maps, because the kids, these young athletes, they did such a brilliant and phenomenal job at being able to operationally define fun for us and to give us this visual framework through the fun maps to help us as adults understand what that really looks like in the, in, the, in the mind of a child, even when we distill it down like this, this is super helpful, but it's also a lot, right? So this three letter word fun, that is so pivotal to keeping kids involved in sport, and that I, and I think Heather would agree here as well, right? It fuels their motivation. It is fundamental to their movement competence. It gives them the motivation. It is a part of connection and belonging, all these social aspects of fun. But even this still, if I am a coach out on the ice, how, unless I sit down and I study this for hours, how am I going to act on this, right? So what I wanted to do is then think about it from a coaching perspective and think, okay, there's 81 fun determinants. Kids have told us, they organize it. Their understanding is 11 factors. Children are brilliant. And as an adult who has, who's you know, coaching one or more teams, has a full-time job, how do I construct the most fun sport experiences to keep these kids involved? Give them the best opportunity possible to develop as athletes. It's gotta be quicker and it's gotta be simpler, right? So another way to conceptualize this that has been effective is to really think about the fun maps in terms of these six different concepts, right? So what we know, <clears throat> We know from fun, and go back here just so everyone can kind of see very quickly again, if you take a really hard look 
at each of these determinants that are organized within each of the fun factors, you very clearly see that fun is athletic development. It is what fuels kids. It is not goofing off and playing around. It is task oriented. It is driven by learning and improving. So if we take that understanding and we think about fun as, okay, fun is development. It's this developmental concept. So how do I as a coach create that? So what is really helpful, I think, is to think about fun as more of a sensory, holistic experience. So if development is our aim, then if we understand that fun is a physical experience, right? So it's getting playing time, it's competing, it's being active, moving on the ice constantly. It's getting lots and lots of touches on the puck. It is very much a tactical, kinesthetic, physical experience. Those are things that I have control over as a coach in constructing that environment in my practices and in my game settings. I can control that physical experience for kids. What else can I control as a coach? I can, co I can control fun as a verbal experience, right? So if we go back to all of those 81 fun determinants, Everything that's talked about in terms of verbal determinant, kids are talking about what makes it fun. It's getting positive feedback and encouragement, right? It's knowing what to do when, getting that really crisp, clear communication. And it's also in asking them, giving them good questions rather than always directing them in terms of what to do, right? kids want to be challenged and they don't do that simply by just doing what coaches tell them to do. From a verbal experience too, right, when we talk about team sports, there's always officials and referees that are involved and they have an impact on the game as well. So having refs that are highly educated, that have experience, that are making consistent calls. It's not something that we have control over, but it's something that at least we know can impact the experience on the ice. Fun is also an emotional experience, right? And you think about just from your own experiences as an athlete or, or just quite simply as a human being, right? Active listening, being heard. Right? Think about moments where you have been heard and where you know you're not being heard and how much that infuses that experience. So part of creating a practice session that is fun is not only actively listening as coaches, but it's also creating the psychological and emotionally safe environment around learning. So again, if you go back to the fun maps and all of those 81 determinants, that's what kids are talking about as well. Doing the things that help build their confidence. And a lot of times that comes from us as coaches in terms of our verbal interaction with them, how we give feedback, how we give encouragement, how we high five them, how we keep them going. Fun is also a social experience. Right? So when we talk about that social interaction that occurs in team sports out on the ice, how do we as coaches facilitate that? What are the different types of positive team dynamics, the different types of team rituals and things that we do that foster that experience? Right? The different things that we do in terms of high-fiving, fist bumping, that's a tactical physical experience but is a celebratory thing. It's really, it's a small part that has a big impact. The other social aspect is not only, you know, do kids talk about this sense of, of camaraderie that they have on the ice and in the locker room, but that's also fostered by doing things outside the rink as well. 
And then finally, the environment, right? Fun is an environmental experience. So kids talk about what makes practice fun. They want well-organized practices. They talk about having small-sided games and drills where they're constantly moving. They get lots of touches on the puck, right? Different types of drills that get them to think about how they should respond and react rather than being directed to by their coaches. Environmentally, other things that we don't necessarily have control over, but having good ice and playing in training conditions, right? All of us know who have been athletes that have grown up on the ice, having good ice and having bad ice makes a difference. Not a break, make or break type of thing, but it's a component of that, of that experience for kids as well. And then also playing against evenly matched teams, right? This is huge. Kids want to be challenged and they want to be challenged in appropriate level. So they don't want blowout games. That's what they call not fun, right? So they want to be well matched in terms of their skills and their abilities, which challenge them and also get them to develop and to learn and to improve. So these are, this is another way to kind of conceptualize all of this rich data that we have behind the science of everything that makes playing sports fun or being on the ice fun for kids in a way that's much more consumable. So for me, I know that if I go out on the ice as a coach, if I am thinking about how do I construct my practice sessions in terms of what is the physical experience that I'm providing for my kids, that physical, kinesthetic, tactical experience. What am I doing verbally? What am I doing emotionally, socially? What is the environment like? If we can bring these five things together, then we're really coming together around this sense of development. Which brings me to the five essential elements of a quality practice session by USA Hockey, right? So the first one is fun. And apparently it looks like this. <laughs> Right? So what's important, I think, to understand is this, this is another sort of visual infographic that helps us kind of make things much more palatable. So if I were gonna design this, it might look a little bit different, right? But what I wanna point out here is that what USA Hockey has done a great job of is breaking this down in terms of thinking about how this contributes to the experience of a young ice hockey player, right? So based upon the science, arguably, fun is this big overarching thing, right? This is, that's the first element. And to be more factual and grounded in the science, elements two, lots of boxes, lots of touches on the puck, Three, constant decision making, right? That sense of being challenged, that sense of um, developing their hockey IQ. Small sided games, the element number four, and then five levels of challenge. So if you go back to the scientific papers, if you go back to the infographic, if you go back to any of the ways that we have tried to over time make this much more consumable, Elements two, three, four, and five are what makes it fun. And what makes it fun is synonymous with athletic development. So kids are telling us this is what they're looking for in their hockey experiences. So again, just going back to how do we actually distill this down and whether it's we're looking at it this way or we're thinking about it this way, right? These are tactical or <clears throat> practical rather, tangible ways in which we can take the science and infuse it into the quality practice sessions that we're constructing for our athletes. The other thing that, that I just wanna share very quickly here as well is that you know, whenever I go out and I do 
clinics or workshops or give keynote addresses and sharing the science behind fun. The questions from the audience always are, this is, this is great, now tell me how the girls are different from the boys, right? Because what drives fun for girls is different than what drives fun for boys. And what's interesting though, is that our data does not actually support that. And I think all of the girl and women athletes here on the webinar today would attest to that as well. So here's the data that we have comparing girls and boys on the fun maps. So you have each of these data points represents one of the 81 fun determinants. This data is plotted on an X and Y axis, girls on the X, boys on the Y. And so what we see here is a very, very clear linear relationship between girls and boys. So which essentially means is however girls are rating in terms of importance, each of these fun determinants, boys are rating it exactly the same way. So just to draw your attention down to the R value that's in, in red, in the red circle there. That R value can range from negative one to positive one. We have an R value of 0.93. So the more similar they are in terms of being a linear relationship, the closer it is to one. This is 0.93, which is almost as perfect a relationship between girls and boys as you can get in science. An inverse relationship, so if it was boys rated this higher, girls rated this lower, would have given us a negative 9.3 and the data would have been in the other direction. But again, here we find a very clear linear relationship. So this data then debunks a lot of the myths that we hold about girls and boys when it comes to fun and what fuels them in terms of their participation. Team friendships, the social aspect of sport, it is important. It absolutely is important, right? So I go back to here. Fun is a social experience as well. But we also find that it's not the most important. And it's no more important for girls than it is for boys. And that's what we're finding in the data here. The other question that we always get to is how does this look when we compare younger kids and older kids? And you can see here, it looks exactly the same way. That there is relatively no difference between what is most important for young players compared to older players. And then finally, the other question we get to is, okay, so there's no, there's no sex or gender differences. We don't have any age difference here is there a competition level effect at all? And the answer here again, as you might guess, by now is no. It looks exactly the same as well. So these data fly in the face of gender norms and expectations, cultural stereotypes, whether we hold these consciously or unconsciously. But what's nice about them is that it simplifies fun, right? So how we construct our practice sessions for girls and boys, when it comes to athletic development, these kids are asking for the exact same things, whether they're young or older, or whether they're rack or travel. So what this looks like might in its implementation look a bit different, but fundamentally what they're asking for is exactly the same. And so I will end on that note there and turn it back over to Heather. Awesome stuff, Amanda. So exciting. Um, getting a lot of, my phone's blowing up here with a lot of positive feedback from this. Um, so I do have one question for you to start off. Um, can you tell us more about using small area games and creating more game-like drills and its impact on the level of effort kids demonstrate when compared to the more traditional choreographed prescribed flow drills? So if you imagine, if you think about the, the drills that we, that we construct on the ice, 
right? You, you're telling a kid to skate from one blue line to the other blue line or to skate from one cone to the other cone or to maybe do a crisscross in between, right? What you find when you ask kids to do that is that they tend to just sort of move through the motions, right? They're doing what you're telling them to do. They may give some effort. Sometimes they typically probably give even less effort, right? There's no real challenge in it. They're not learning. There's no interaction. All of these other fundamental things that make the experience fun and that drive athletic development aren't present in those types of drills. When you do small area games, small sided, uh, much more interactive types of exercises on the ice or on the field with kids where they're interacting in smaller groups on a smaller surface. They tend to get a lot more touches on the puck, a lot more touches on the ball. They have to interact, right, in, in a much more constrained space so that the interaction that is occurring, particularly in a, in a contact sport or semi-contact sport like ice hockey, that's, that's important, or even in soccer, right, where you have less of that, right? So what kids are talking about when we, when we think about fun, fun is these moment to moment experiences, right? So if we go back to here again, right? And I'm thinking as a coach, what is the physical experience? How am I constructing this, this drill or this practice session that makes it highly physical, very tactile, very kinesthetic? In the context of setting that up on the ice, what am I doing verbally that's contributing to that experience? What am I doing emotionally that contributes to that? Socially, how are the kids interacting, right? Positive team dynamics is the number two rated fun factor, right? So behind trying hard comes positive team dynamics followed by positive coaching. So if we think about it in that way as well, and we think about doing these on smaller surfaces, we are essentially fostering a greater number of the fun determinants in any one small set experience. And so if you think about it, the more of those determinants that you can be including in that practice or in that drill or that small sided game, the more fun, the more challenge, the more development kids are gonna have. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the fun determinants as well is, you know, taking a skill that you learned in practice and using it in a game. And when you challenge kids in a more game-like environment in practice, those skills are often much more transferable into a game-like experience as well. Um, so that's another thing. So we have a couple of, of good questions here. Um, some about the who, who you surveyed. So um, mm -hmm. did you survey boys and girls that were playing together, like on mixed teams, or were they already separated by gender? And did you survey multiple sports? What sports did you survey? Okay, great questions. So to do this particular study, um, like I said, we had kids brainstorm, sort, and rate. So it's a... It's a high cost, high resource type of research methodology. We had to embed ourselves in one sporting community and we chose soccer to start because it is one of the most accessible sports for girls and for boys across socioeconomic strata. And the other thing is that in doing that, what we found, at least in the sample that we had that contributed their data to the development of the fun maps, 75.5% of them played other sports as well. So they, they played soccer, but they played hockey, or they also played basketball, or they you know, also did tennis. So the majority of them were multi-sport athletes. Um, in terms of the composition when the data was collected in terms of whether or not they were co-ed or they were already broken up, I would say based on my recollection at the time, it was a combination. And so some of the younger teams, we were able to get co-ed um, where they had girls and boys, although 
there tended to be a greater number of boys in those instances, which is not uncommon. Um, but we were very, we were very strategic in trying to get a sample that was equal across girls and boys as possible, rec and travel, and then younger and older as well. Because looking, being able to look at the data in this particular way, we wanted to make sure that we had enough power in order to do those analyses and to come away from the results with some confidence that what we were getting is actually what is happening. Perfect. Um, this is coming from our friend Juan Gonzalez. Uh, so they want, he wants to know, is there any data around what adults considered consider fun towards the children's sporting experience? Is there any data? <laughs> we haven't done that study yet. Well, I think in comparison to like what, you know, the coaches think are important, what the coaches think the kids think is important, and then what the kids are actually saying, I think is what he's getting at. Okay. Um, well, so no matter how we kind of interpret that question, right, I would say based upon the, first, the way that I first said it or thought about it, um, and I think Heather would attest to this too, right? In all the years that she kind of walked around and still does with the fun maps in her back pocket and her back, you know, her backpack, you know, and we, all of us that are really kind of um, involved in this sport space, when we look at the fun maps, we say, absolutely, right? That even as adults now, and the way in which we are still our own type of athlete, these are the same things that we want and need. So that fundamentally doesn't change. What we do find is that, and I didn't present that, this here today, but we have data that looks at, so this is what kids are saying is fun. And what are the coaches' perspectives on what is most and fun? And then what is, the parents' perspectives as well, and how does that flush out? And what we found in that data was that players and parents were largely on the same page. Players and, or sorry, younger players and their coaches were also largely on the same page. So if we go back to here, Right, so if we think about, <clears throat> this is how kids understand and rank order fun. Trying hard, positive team dynamics, positive coaching, so on, so on. So when we compare the perspectives of players to parents, they are, there's a fundamental understanding. So parents are saying that yes, trying hard is most important for kids. Positive team dynamics is second most important, so on and so on. When we compare players, younger players and their coaches, data looks very similar. When we compare older players and their coaches, that's where this occurs, right? And so this is the first data that we have, I, I think in the sports science literature, that really starts to help us understand this disconnect in fun and what coaches understanding of what players needs actually are and that that um that discordance that, that's occurring there that starts to help us understand a little bit more why kids are dropping out in that adolescent age range so if fun is the number one reason why kids stay in sport and lack or absence of it is the number one why they, reason why they drop out and older players' coaches have a disconnected understanding of what their players' fun priorities are, then it all starts to make a little bit more sense. Yep, absolutely. And I think one of the things to, to kind of highlight without going into too much detail on, on that data is that, you know, the players, the older players are still saying that trying hard is one of the most, it's the most important thing to fun and coaches rank it, I think at like, is it sixth? And so yeah, six. that, 
that disconnect that there's no way that my players think that trying hard is the most fun. I can't get them to try <laughs> hard if my life depended on it. It all goes back to how are we constructing the environment to not, you know, push that, that, um, that action or behavior on your kids. Like they're trying hard because they don't want to get yelled at or screamed at, or, you know, rather than pulling that behavior out of them, how are we setting up these games in these stations to actually, you know, pull that, that behavior, that trying hard, that effort out of them. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that or. Well, it's, it's interesting, right? Because the, the coaches rated somewhere around number six, but yet they rate positive coaching all the way up at the top, <laughs> right? Which is, I mean, that is its own sort of um, research phenomenon is we, we also tend to, um, underscore or, or have a, a greater sense of our own value right so it kind of makes sense in that way um but when you think about you know the the interconnections here when you're looking at this infographic and the interrelationships between positive coaching and everything that you see there with trying hard these things these things are they're married in a, in a very tightly woven way so I, again, I think it just brings, brings to light a little bit more of the disconnect in how coaches conceptualize and their understanding of what they think players want. Perfect. Um, so we have one here, just a clarification on the age breakdown of younger athletes and older athletes, if you want to highlight that real yep. quick. Not here. So I think just the age group. Yeah, so the age, so the age is the younger kids were U8, U9, up to U13, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the older were U14 to U19. Is yep. how we broke them up. Um, so two pretty good questions here. Um, first one is, do you have any data on how collegiate or professional players define fun? What about 18 year olds versus older players? I think it's probably actually fairly similar into adulthood, but it may be interesting to see how universal this framework is. So we don't have a college or a professional fun map, but I can tell you from um, both in doing sports psychology with both of those populations and being well versed in the sports science or sorry, sports psychology literature as it relates to those specific populations, both at the collegiate level and the professional level, is that they define it the exact same way, right? Mm -hmm. So what I, one of the other things that I like to kind of dispel as well and have discussion around is this myth, not only that we should expect to see sex or gender differences, competition level differences, or um, it, this age effect, but it's also this idea that fun is in sport categorically different from one kid to the next kid, right? Mm -hmm. What this science shows us is that fun, when we think about fun as an emotive experience, right? We all we know when we are having fun in the moment, and we know precisely when we're not having fun. And that internal experience that we feel, I believe, is universal, mm -hmm. right? So then we, we basically, we engage these, these young athletes, these kids, and they, they deconstructed fun for us right, through these fun maps. And so what would make fun drastically different from one kid to the next kid, the data shows that, and I think when we all independently reflect upon our own experiences, it's, it's fundamentally the same. Right. But I think that that's, those are, those are good signs and it makes coaching a little bit easier. Right. Yeah. Um, and as a coach and just as 
just as a human being because of the way, because of the world in which we live and these socially and culturally constructed attitudes, expectations, we are in many ways we are programmed to think this way that we're all fundamentally different and that all our wants and needs and interests are different and what the data shows is not just here right but in all areas of psychology neuropsychology developmental psychology all of it shows us is that we are more similar than we are different. And I think that that makes it easier for us as coaches. Yeah. Um, we, got the, we got the winning question. Where are your thoughts <laughs> about winning? And, uh, and I think it might be, you know, to elaborate on, on that question a little bit to maybe talk about the, the difference in the process and outcome uh, determinants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's the other question, or that's the other big question here. So whether it comes before the age, the gender, you know, the, the competition level differences, everybody wants to know, well, where does winning rank, right? So I think it's, <laughs> it's always really interesting because if you, take a, if you, if you do a, a quick survey poll of parents and coaches and you ask them where winning, where they think winning ranks, they almost always say it's somewhere in the top 20 out of the 81 right and some will say you know it's in the top 10 so immediately they want to know well, where did kids rank it and i i believe when we looked at, at this at the data in this particular way in the paper that just came out this month um it ranks number 40 or 41 out of the 81 so it's right smack in the middle right, when you rank order these from most important to least important. And so what I always like to draw a lot of attention to is that when we look at all 81 fund determinants, I'll go back here again real quickly, right, if we look at all of these specific determinants, winning is the only outcome-based determinant, right, and it makes sense that it would be on the map because winning and achieving, you know, is, is, is fun. It, it absolutely is fun. Is it the most important thing? No, right? So the, all of the other 80 fun determinants of the 81 are all process oriented. So that's where I go back to as a coach, making sure that we have a solid understanding that fun is a moment to moment experience. And through each of these determinants, we can construct that type of quality experience for kids. How that comes together in terms of the outcome of the game is dependent upon lots of other things, many of which in team sport, we are not in control over because you don't have control over your opponent, right? So I think what's also fundamental about this is that from an anecdotal perspective, when you ask kids about these things or, or what role winning has, and the data that we have um, from the Swedish ice hockey and basketball players as well shows this is that I think they more than adults, they see, they, they have an understanding that it is a part of the game, right? There will be a win or a loss at the end of a competitive match, but it is not the most important thing in terms of what keeps them, keeps, <clears throat> keeps them showing up back at the rink and on the ice every time. So being able to really focus on the process and doing all of these things, you can also argue that by fostering all of the other 80 determinants, we are actually setting our young athletes up to give them the best possible opportunity to compete in order to win. All right, um, I, I think we have one last question and then I'm gonna pass it back to Dave. Um, 
So do you think that a player can explicitly express in words what is fun? Have you identified what they enjoy or what they can explicitly express in words? Is there a downside to a deconstructive approach? All right, ask the beginning of that again. <laughs> Do you think that a player can explicitly express in words what is fun? Yes. <laughs> I think, well, not only did they do that here quite well, right? Um, and that's, if we go back to the methodology that we're using here, right? Apologize, right? So concept mapping is a type of structured research method that takes the best of qualitative research methods and integrates them with quantitative research methods. So we started with brainstorming, which is an inductive approach. So the way that we did this, and I, I didn't probably explain this very well at the beginning, was we asked kids, one thing that makes playing sports fun for players is, and then they brainstormed as many different ideas as they could, right? So it's a completely inductive approach. They're generating all of those different ideas, right? We look at all of those ideas. They identified 81 specific discrete things that make it fun. And then we went back to them and said, this, you guys distilled, you, you defined fun phenomenally. Sort these ideas in a way that makes sense to you and then rate, right? So it's really, it's a multi-method approach that integrates lots of different processes but it's all completely participant driven. And that was really also the impetus behind doing this type of research. So as a sports psychology person, my philosophical approach is one that is person-centered or what we call in the sports space, athlete-centered, right? And when I am doing sports psychology, working with athletes one-on-one -on -one or with the team or with an entire organization, whether it's at a youth level or a professional level, what is fundamentally most important besides the rapport and the, and the therapeutic relationship between me, excuse me, between me and them, is that I understand their experience and their worldview through their eyes. And that was really the impetus behind doing this. Right, is we knew, we have known for many, many, many years that fun is the number one reason why kids play and why they drop out. But we didn't have a really full, rich understanding beyond what that actually meant to kids until they helped us construct, or they really constructed the fun map. So this is really, when I say, you know, you look at all the different maps, it is a visual framework for how children, how young athletes, between the ages of you know, U8 all the way up to U19, when they think about fun, the fun maps are how they construct it. And that is their understanding of fun, not ours.